Welcome to the Organic Wine Podcast. I'm Adam Huss, coming to you from somewhere outside in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. And I really appreciate you listening. This is a little special intro. I'm recording at night under the stars. And you may hear a little cricket and frog noise in the background or not. I also want to thank Brent Smith for your donation to help make this podcast possible. It means a lot. And if you're listening and you'd like to help get the word out about how wine can be an ecological and regenerative solution to some of our biggest problems, please send a donation through Venmo to at Centralis. That's at C-E-N-T-R-A-L-A-S. It's associated with my name, Adam Huss, and your contribution goes directly to covering the costs of the many hours and real production expenses behind every episode of the Organic Wine Podcast. So thank you. My guest for this special episode is Kelly Mulville. Now, Kelly is not in upstate New York, (laughs) but Kelly's life has been guided by an awe and respect for the natural world and a deep appreciation for its beauty. This led him to want to learn how to farm in a way that protected or enhanced the natural world and made him a better listener and observer of what made ecosystems work. Through his years of farming, he has attempted to answer the question of how we can turn agriculture from one of the most destructive forces on the planet into the method that we can use to repair the damage and restore biodiversity and health to ecosystems. Kelly's journey has led him to test various kinds of grazing-based viticulture in many contexts throughout the West and Southwest U.S., and to ultimately build a vineyard system that incorporates animals year-round in Central California at Picinus Ranch. The work he is doing is laying the foundation for what I think will be the future of viticulture, and Kelly lays out the vision and principles that guide it. Kelly is working with vinifera that he basically doesn't have to spray because of the systems he has implemented and his attention to soil health, biodiversity, and amazing new findings around sap bricks analysis that is revolutionizing our understanding of how we can prevent insect pest issues. We get into the details of the Watson trellising system that he now uses to create a kind of vine forest rather than a vineyard, as well as how to potentially integrate sheep year-round into an existing VSP trellis system. We get into ground squirrel management, the ecology of birds in viticulture and agricultural systems, and the amazing return of an endangered species for which his vineyard is helping to provide desirable habitat. If you haven't heard of Kelly Mulville or the work that he's doing at Piscinus Ranch, this is potentially revolutionary stuff. I could not be more impressed with Kelly's humble, passionate, and compassionate approach to viticulture. He grounds everything he does in science and real detailed data because he sees everything he has accomplished so far as just the beginning. And he wants others to be able to learn from and build upon his work to do even better. Enjoy. Kelly, welcome. Thanks so much for doing this. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thanks for having me. You know, I'm just going to start with a little something. I've been listening to your voice recently. And has anyone ever told you you sound like Clint Eastwood? Um, I hear it all the time, and and I also hear that I look like him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that as well. Well, we'll just, I think that's how I'll introduce you then, um, you know, when I do the introduction for this. My my interview today is with Clint Eastwood, <laughs> and nobody will know the difference, you know. <laughs> I'll just cut out this part where I said your name, and we'll take it from there. <laughs> uh in his later years, Clint has become an expert in grazing-based uh, viticulture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here to share I started his wealth doing of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, well, well, okay. So let's talk about who you really are and how how you ended up there. I, I am. There's so many great things that you are an expert in, and I, I wonder if you could just give us a sense of how where you are and how you sort of got there in a in a you know, brief, big picture sort of way. Yeah. So I, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, kind of on the edge of El Paso. And, um, um, I, I, as a, at a young age, I got, uh, really into, um, chili farming and which is interesting because it's so, it is also very terroir based. And, um, during my spell of, of, of growing chilies and we had a little farm stand where we sold stuff from our kind of family market farm, I, um, 
during that time, I also got, well, actually, even before Chili's, I got into Raptors and Falconry. And mm-hmm. it was actually my my delving into Falconry and starting to raise hawks when I was 11 that I realized and got into, you know, the whole thing that was going on with declining Raptor numbers and DDT and all that stuff. I read Silent Spring. I was pretty devastated. I've been depressed mm-hmm. ever since, basically. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the poisons have changed, but the practices haven't in a uh, lot of ways. Yeah. So I um that that but that spurned me to realizing that agriculture was was a big problem for the raptors declining and then and a lot of other stuff. And so the, the type of agriculture that was most common. And so that got me into organic uh, farming and mm. um which uh, eventually led me to California to go to the farm and garden program at UC Santa Cruz. And I just um, want to, okay, I'm going to, I want to pause you at UC Santa Cruz farm and garden program okay. and say, this is unique. I, I'm just realizing this as you're saying this, but I think a lot of people get into organics for self oriented reasons. And and I think it's kind of remarkable that it was your compassion and empathy for these cre- the beauty of these creatures that you were fascinated with that actually ma- heightened your awareness. That's that's actually really interesting. I mean, that's a that's a that's a big compliment to your character. And 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 uh, I, I you know most people are concerned about what they're putting into their bodies or their you know their you know maybe it's not pure self interest. They're concerned about their family. You know, but. I think this is such a beautiful way to get into caring about these things. I just wanted to throw that out there. Feel free to comment or continue. Well, I was just going to say that's that's a that's the biggest driver in my life. It's just kind of this. Um, um, I, I guess compassion is one level, but in another sense, it's just complete um, awe of the natural world mm. and um, immense respect and gratitude for that. Yeah. So that's, that's that's kind of been driving just about everything I, I've done since I was a kid. Well, I mean, I personally, I, you probably wouldn't say this, but I think that's so, I mean, maybe you would say this in a philosophical sense, but not about yourself. But I, I mean, I think it's so important to what you've accomplished that you approached it that way, because I think it's made you probably a better listener, a better observer of the natural world to see what works and what systems integrate better with it because of that awe and respect and and yeah just you know love of that um that's i think that's so important i can't i i mean we can end now and the, you you've done your job just by uh by by living by example that way um but please don't don't end uh, uh let's uh okay so you're at uc santa cruz uh yep at uc santa cruz um mainly because i i, th- I thought it was I thought it was a pretty good organic farmer and I had a big crop failure one year. And so I decided, and that was really at that time, that was, so I was there in 83. And um, at that time, that was really the only place to go to kind of get a hands-on learning experience in organic. It was, it was called French intensive biodynamic uh, agriculture. Then. And so um, the, the funny thing is I had no interest in wine at that time. And um but I, I left there and then was on a ranch in Colorado working. And a friend of mine who I had gone to high school with and whose ranch I had also worked on showed me an article about Alan Savory and holistic management. And I just that just really clicked what I was learning about him. And he had he had just come to the United States like a couple of years earlier. And so I um my mode of transportation at that time was a bicycle. And so at the end of the season, I hopped on my bike and rode down to Albuquerque and knocked on his door and said, Hey, I want to, I want to learn more about this. And um, so spent um, basically, I don't know, three hours with him just going over stuff and asking where can I learn? This is exact. This is really what it's about for me is how do we restore ecosystems? And, um, so he offered me a scholarship to his course, probably based on my mode of transportation. And, um, <laughs> and so I went, I went to a class and after that class, I said, okay, Alan, there's, I can't, I can't learn this at any university in this country because they're all trying to hang you. So <clears throat> what if you put together some type of, of more in-depth learning program 
for those of us who want to do a deep dive into this, and he ended up putting together a degree program, which then became the Certified Educators Program, which is the Certified Educators Program is still going on. Um, mm -hmm. So I went through that while I was working at a ranch and working with ranchers, and was just really impressed by how they were restoring ecosystems with, with livestock. I, I mm -hmm. joked that I spent my early years chasing livestock out of my market farm, and I'm spending all my adult life trying to get animals back in. <laughs> <laughs> so um, those are those 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 were the uh, big influences, um, some of the bigger influences. And then also my my father was an architect, and so everything in our life was designed for better or worse. And just this whole idea of how do we design systems because we have no design in agriculture. You can get a PhD in agricultural engineering. And as far as I know, there's not a single design class offered at any, any agricultural university or any university for that matter, which is really phenomenal to think that's the way that we, inter the, that we interact. The main impact and the main way we interact with the natural world is through agriculture. And we have no sense, no no concept of designing to work with agriculture. Now, what did you do in the absence of that? How did you begin to approach what what you began to pursue and 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 what problems did you like what what are the problems that we need to solve, I guess, on a on a bigger scale and with that with a look at our agriculture to to make it a more ecological agricultural design. It's funny because for a while I was a, a vegetarian just because of all the damage I was seeing on rangelands through livestock. And this was when mm. I was like a teenager. And um, so it was ironic that when, when I came across Savory, he was actually doing what Aldo Leopold talked about years before and saying that we might very well end up using the same tools that have that have in, in tools and practices that have that have compromised the ecosystem to restore it and yeah. so when you think about that that's exactly what savory was doing he was using the tool of livestock which he at, at one point I, in rhodesia he had said that he would um that he wanted to shoot every cow in the country in any rancher that stood in his way because ecosystems had to be restored and cattle were the problem. You realize that thinking was wrong and that really what we needed to look at is, is, is how do we make nature and perhaps cattle can be a tool in doing that. Livestock can be a tool in doing that. And so kind of back to your initial point there, um, how did I go about bringing design thinking into agricultural practices was in a large part due to the to the to the decision making framework that Savory put together in holistic management and having a framework that is taking ecosystem processes into consideration things like water cycle mineral cycle um, uh, th those aspects of that are universal to the ecosystem uh, and looking at those when you make when you create a context of what you're trying to do and so basically putting uh putting the ecosystem first because we have not been doing that and we've gotten into a lot of trouble with that and i unfortunately i think our culture we have to we have to do that i think a lot of indigenous cultures that was just the way they did things that they were so tied into the ecosystem that it wasn't like something you had to stand back and say, "Oh, well, we should be considering, you know, the 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 effect on on, on other forms of life." And so, um, so we're in like this reverse hmm. pattern of trying to figure out how to live on this planet and take care of it. And so yeah. there's and 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 it's funny when you referred to me as an expert. I don't consider myself an expert in anything. And but it's just it's just this learning process that a lot of us are going through and saying, you, you failed okay, at it more than the rest of us have that's all i mean Is exactly that... <laughs> and, and, and I, I i am an expert at failing at stuff i would say <laughs> but occasionally you find something that works so yeah. <laughs> uh, i love that well when did wine enter your life and how did it a wine entered my life uh, to backtrack a little bit my parents had a 
winemaking class at, at our house when I was a kid. And um, I had no interest in it. I had no interest in it until I was about 35 years old. And I was living at 10,000 feet in Colorado. And friends had a restaurant that was a tiny restaurant that was getting rave reviews. And except, <laughs> and I just heard this recently in, in, in visiting them. They said, yeah, we're getting all these great reviews, except someone was finally honest. And they said that their wine list was insipid. <laughs> <laughs> so they decided to invite some friends over. So this was only open seasonally and during the summer. It wasn't a ski town or anything. So it was just uh, uh, it was the, the the busy time was summer, and they invited some locals over to do go through a wine tasting and write notes, and so that they could develop their wine list uh, based off of other people's ideas. And that was the first time I'd gone through and tasted wine, and was just blown away by how good mm. some of it could be and how varied it could be. And within probably like less than two years of that, I was putting in a vineyard, never having put in a vineyard before. So wow. it was- Where, it was, in, in Colorado? No, no, that was the, the oh. vineyard I put, the first vineyard I put in was in, uh, at the edge of the Chihuahuan Desert in Southeast Arizona. Oh, a Wilcox area? Um, over the hill from Wilcox in the Chiricahua okay. Mountains. Wow. Fantastic. Okay. And I think was there anything the else only... there? Were there any other vineyards nearby? No, it, 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 and I think it's still the only vineyard there. It, it was surrounded by national forest. Wow. And um, <laughs> pretty remote, yeah. Well, this is why you said it is uh, possible to grow grapes well in a uh, monsoon climate. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you have experience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I lived in Breckenridge for a time uh, at 10,000 feet. So it's it's a fun experience when you get acclimated to that and then come down to, to the lowlands and uh, feel like you can do anything and drink anything too, it seems like. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you had that experience, but <laughs> you ended up in Col uh, in California eventually, right? I mean, with, yes. with was the you weren't combining livestock in uh, in Arizona. Um, that was my first attempt at integrating animals into a uh, domestic animals into a vineyard. The, the, the oh, place okay. is the place is famous for the um, because it has some of the most biodiversity in the lower forty eight. Um, you have everything from uh, kind of desert, for instance, just in botanically speaking, you have have everything from cactus to to tropical subtropical plants there, and same with birds. You have an incredible diversity of birds, including uh, trogons. There used to be a large population of small-billed parrots in that area, and so it's a it's a pretty phenomenal area. Jaguar. Um, so that first vineyard I put in, I had to I actually had to put in an electric fence to keep out bear. That's where the state dropped off all their problem bears that were raiding campsites, <laughs> and so they had no fear of people. So I knew that that would be a problem I would have to deal with before it came. But uh, we also had, so we had mountain lion, jaguar, peccaries, um, uh, ringtail cats, cotamundis, which are kind of like a cross between a raccoon and a monkey. Um, it was just phenomenal. And then the amount wow. of birds and everything was there. So it was, a, uh, it was a biological wonderland. And I was trying to keep out the, the, the larger animals that would eat grapes. The peccaries are little pig-like things, right? Right. They're, they're also known as javelinas. Oh, okay. I didn't know if they were separate from. It. I was going to ask if that was uh, if you have two species there, but so that it's just a different name. Yeah. Got it. All right. And what were you integrating into that vineyard? Was it sheep in there? So no, it was not sheep. There had been. It was an apple orchard before I turned it into a vineyard. And um, the I had neighbors that actually they uh, they they taught at a Mennonite college, and they had a group of students for a like a like a short course in, on ecological and social issues in the Southwest. And they ended up, that, that class ended up helping me plant that vineyard, which was great because there was, there was nobody around. <laughs> but, um, there was no labor force. <laughs> but they, no they, they ran a cattle ranch for her brother. And so I said, hey, I would like to put some cattle in here. And that, that attempt was to put cattle in before planting to start cycling nutrients and, and getting some dung and urine in there and um we okay. put the cattle in and they were um was, we opened the trailer and put them into a gate and they ran through the vineyard 
wiped out a lot of the trellis post I'd installed and went through a 13 wire, 10,000 volt electric fence. And we didn't see him again for about two weeks. So, <laughs> this is, you know, that, that was my first introduction into trying to put animals into a vineyard. Um, was that your last time with, with, uh, that large of an animal or did you, it was, it was my last, it was, it was the last time trying to put cattle who had hardly seen people <laughs> into, into <a> <laughs> right, right. Right. <laughs> Right, let's go round up some bison, some uh, <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah. see how that works. Yeah, um, well, fun. So a big learning experience. I mean, that sounds like a magical vineyard place situation. That sounds incredible. Um, yeah, it, it really first is. Of all. Yeah, one is of my it favorite still going part. on? It it is. It uh, fantastic. It ended up being sold, and okay. um, and they're still making wine from there. And I I was I was looking it up one time to see. Uh, see if anything was going on. And a, and a wine reviewer said that he thought that the Coon Was coming from that vineyard was the best wine in Arizona. Um, wow. And I have actually not had a chance to try that, which I, which I would like to need to do that. Nice. Okay. So, um, I mean, we could probably jump ahead to where are you now? Yeah. So I, um, I'm, I'm at Picinus Ranch in um, San Benito County, California. And sort of, um, sort of north central coast. It is. Um, it is kind of north central coast. We're directly east of Monor- of um, Salinas. It's just over the okay. hill from us, and we are so, south of Hollister. Um, probably one of the most famous vineyards in our neighborhood is Calera, um, mm-hmm. but we also have uh, Eden Rift on the other side of us, and um, uh, Ends Vineyard which is one of uh-huh. the oldest producing vineyards in the state. Um, and um, so, yeah, so this is a, and this is, was actually the second AVA to be established in California. So it has a long history of growing grapes. Wow. So how, so did, did you find them or did they find you? I mean, because essentially the, the Piscinus ranch owners gave you a, a pretty um, amazing canvas to work your, to do your, your art on, I think. If, if, uh, if that's, if you, that analogy applies. Yeah, they, they did. And what happened was, um, I when I was I was I was here before uh, working. I worked a couple of vineyards in California, um, all of which I had integrated sheep in. And this was starting in about um, 2005. And um, the during that time, or early in in my involvement with holistic management, a, a, a group put together something called the Quivera Coalition, which was a attempt to get ranchers and environmentalists to work together. And they started putting on a, a conference every year. And that conference is still going on. It's called the Regenerate Conference. And at one of those conferences, I I had, I had run across Sally maybe once or twice, the, the owner of Piscinus Ranch in California. But we didn't really know each other very well. But she was at that conference. I was at that conference. And a... Uh, a range management consultant from Australia, who was a mutual friend of both of ours, was also there. And she got us together and said, Sally wants to put in a vineyard in at her ranch. And I told her not to do anything until she talks to you. Hmm. And I was about to do a presentation at EcoFarm, the first presentation I did in, in California on, on this idea. And I knew Sally's ranch was fairly close to Monterey, which is where the EcoFarm conference is every year. And I said, Sally, why don't you come to this conference and 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 listen to what I'm working on? And if it's of interest to you, then we can talk further. But if it's not, we won't waste each other's time. And so she <laughs> came to that, and and afterwards she said, you need to come to my ranch as soon as possible because now I'm not sure that I can even just do an organic vineyard. And so I came out and we talked, and we kind of went back and forth for about a year, year and a half. And finally, she talked us into coming out here. Uh, my wife and I were living in back in Colorado and farming vegetables at high altitude, also integrating livestock with that operation, and we're considering staying there. But she talked us out of that, and um, <laughs> we've been there ever since then, ever since then. And did you have a trial in California before working on the Pisanus Ranch? I did. And so this is this is backpacking, no. back backtracking a little bit. Uh, and that was that the basis of your presentation that she saw as well. Um, so yes, and so okay. the 
that was based off of a trial I did in Sonoma County, which is the first place where I integrated. Where and 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 thinking about this and looking at at how the ecosystems work in the places where I'd grown grapes, which was in monsoon uh, monsoonal areas of of um, the Southwest, and then in in Mediterranean climates in California, you get either you get your rains in the summer or you get your rains in the winter and spring, and either way. Um, your growth of your of uh, your your peak growth of of your vegetation, whether it's cover crop or, or natural vegetation, is kind of occurring either in late spring in or early to late spring in in Mediterranean climates, or it's occurring in summer in monsoonal climates. And so I realized that if you really want to cycle those nutrients and take advantage of that vegetation in a in a vineyard situation. You need to have the animals in there when the vines are growing, and so right. the challenge is figuring out how you get animals in in those vineyards during that time. And how to, my how to first have thought: them eat the grass, but not the grapes, kind of thing. Right, right. My first <laughs> thought was: um, I, I I was managing this small biodynamic vineyard in, in the Alexander Valley, and I talked to the owner and I said, "Hey, um, are you okay if I put some electric wires in here and try this idea?" of grazing the vineyard during the, during the growing season. She said, yeah, sure. And so I did that and um, kind of thought about where to place the wires because I wanted them to do the suckering for me. I wanted them to, to, um, to do the, obviously browse the, the vineyard floor, but I also then wanted anything that from the top that came and, and kind of draped over to be fair game for them to tip. So I, I set this up and much to my surprise, it worked flawlessly. And it was great because it was, this was a small vineyard taken out of a, like a 60 acre vineyard. And so I had a great control site that was managed conventionally on the other side. And so we, the first year I managed it without sheep at all. The second year, it was just uh, the, kind of the standard winter grazing program that's done with a fair number of vineyards now and then the final year that was um the extended season grazing grazing until about the end of june and at the end of that i ended up writing an article on the benefits that happened from that and it was rejected mm. by every viticulture magazine in this country and it was, picked up, it was picked up immediately by australian new zealand great brewer winemaker and be well, because of that, australia new zealand <laughs> yeah because of that, I was invited to do presentations in both of those countries, and uh, the first vineyard to uh, the first commercial vineyard to adopt that that um, offset system is Insay Vineyard in Insay Victoria, and they're still using that, and they've been on it on it now for over ten years. Um, it's I think it's been really good for them. I check in with them every couple of years, and never had any complaints. So. And it's pretty much featured on their website. It's kind of the first thing that they talk about. Yeah, it's, I mean, well, I've, several things I wanted to just jump in real quick. I, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know, maybe who knows why they did that for other reasons, but sheep are a much bigger part of the culture in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I mean, I know, yeah, like in terms of population of people versus sheep in New Zealand, the sheep far outnumbered the people as far as I last last census count I heard yeah. um and I'm, I'm also like really impressed that you were able to just go into an existing vineyard and this is I mean I think really encouraging for somebody who is considering this but not sure how they would do it since they have an existing vineyard but the fact that you were able to run was it one wire on each side of sort of the growing region is that what you did in that right region one <laughs> electric wire so and yeah. that pretty much took care of what and it was otherwise a vsp system correct great and so i mean just anybody listening you know there was a success that could be replicated in you know most vineyards in california it sounds like um, and many many vineyards one of the yeah oftentimes, many. Yeah. yeah oftentimes the limiting factor is we've gotten this infatuation with tight row spacing and we're to the point where your tractor barely has any wiggle room and th to have these offsets in there means that you're going to lose probably about a foot and a half. Um, ah, okay. So, 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 about, so which it works better which, with like eight foot rows or, or more. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Um, 
so that's yeah so, so that, that that's whenever i'm working with somebody who's interested in that that's the first question i say well what's your row spacing and and how much wiggle room do you have with your tractor and um, hopefully soon that won't be an issue because we'll be able to spray with drones but we're right we're, we're not quite there yet so but yeah, yeah it is it is it is completely possible and the um the so some of the benefits that I discovered just in that first year, and this is this is to me one of the most profound ones. One is a dramatic de- decrease in water use, and uh-huh. we actually had a ninety percent decrease in water use and about a thirteen hundred pound per acre increase in yield. Simultaneously, that's incredible. I mean, that's incredible, especially right now in history. <laughs> yeah. That is so crucial. Wow. Okay, and that's that's why uh, Australia and New Zealand said they picked up the article right away. They said that we, we've been dealing with climate change forever, and um, um, well, they've been dealing with it for a long time. And yeah, they um, so she said we're just a lot more open to possibilities. So uh, that was uh, it, and 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 it, it took me going down there before I got invited to speak over here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, internationally famous, locally obscure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, and and all this background is, I think, really important for everybody to hear because I think what it builds to is what you implemented at Piscinus Ranch. At, because in in a lot of ways, it is uh, taking from all all of the the learning experiences that you had and and rebuilding a system from the ground up with this ecological perspective on how to do a perennial crop integrated with year-round grazing um, and everything else. And before I jump into that, because I want to get into that, but just for anybody listening, if you are trying to be certified organic, is there any issue with keeping your sheep year-round in the vineyard or whatever uh, animal? Um, So that was an issue. And um, I, um, one of the first vineyards that I was grazing was um, we, when I started there. They were just they were just about to become certified organic, and so during that that kind of final review of stuff, I had asked the certifier. I told her that I was interested in in running sheep throughout the growing season, and she said, "Oh, that's not going to be very likely, but I'll I'll listen to you." And so huh. I told her why I wanted to do that, 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 that I, I just felt there was going to be numerous benefits, many of which I didn't even know about at that time. And, and I said, and, and further, I don't know if there's a, a case of human pathogens surviving alcoholic fermentation and, and, and being a problem in wine. Yeah. And so she actually went back to CCOF and had their basically kind of reinterpreted the rulings and made it okay for me to do that or for for, for vineyards to do that and wow is that a is that now a precedent that could be used for others yeah. or well, was that it it, it 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 seems to be um so that was with ccof um okay. and that's california's you know, organic certifier right, right which i think is the largest or, organic certifier in in the united states i'm not sure about that but it, yeah, it, it makes it, sense it makes sense yeah <laughs> But um, when I was in New Zealand, I, uh, uh, some folks from a vineyard after I gave my presentation said that they couldn't sell their wine in America as organic, even though they're certified in New Zealand, because they did leaf pulling in the summer with sheep, which amounts to running them through this, the vineyard quickly, because you just want them to do a little bit of, of leaf removal and then get them out of there. And right. they couldn't, they, they weren't qualified for certification. I had them contact CCOF. And I think almost before I got back from that trip, they were approved. And so wow. I would say that that is somewhat of a precedent. <laughs> wow. Fantastic. Well, and, and just, just I mean, to, for, for the record, the, um, the person who I was working with in that um, is now the person running the re- regenerative organic certification. So, Oh, that's uh, Elizabeth. Um, oh, yeah. Elizabeth okay. Whitlow. Whitlow. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I she she I interviewed her. There's a great podcast with her about the Regenerative Organic Alliance and certification. So yeah. 
anybody's listening, <laughs> you can check that one out. Um, she's she's amazing and great and good. Yeah. That makes me uh, respect her even more that she was able to 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 do that, um, make that happen. Yeah. Um, she, I mean, that in itself is a legacy. <laughs> well done, Elizabeth. I'm just thinking. Well, let's just jump back to uh, you being at Piscinus and what that looks like now. So what maybe the way that I want to go is what what is the vision that you had or what are the what are the principles that you're trying you were trying to accomplish and achieve with this system that you built uh at piscinus and and then you know we could get into the details of what it looks like but i'd love you to sort of talk about you know your vision whether you know like your deep core values as well as the sort of you know the ecological design principles and and just overall perspective on nature and our our interaction with it that informed what you did there so the big overarching um vision kind of for all the agriculture that i've been working on has been if we stand back and look at agriculture it's probably one of the single most destructive things humans have ever implemented um and it's it's this process where we take an ecosystem and make it pretty much devoid of biodiversity and then proceed to reduce the soil health until it can no longer be farmed. <laughs> and so that's not that's not that's not even much less sustainable. It's not even sane. Yeah. And so, um, but the, and and so we've been able to prop this up with with chemicals, and which is which is basically it's you know the the it's it's a, it's a we're on this life support system that is that it can keep something alive, but it's not restoring its health. So the, the the big question is: Can we reverse this? Can we actually use agriculture as a process to restore biodiversity to the planet? And um, that that is that is the big question that has been driving me. And so that is the that is the goal of this this experiment at Pi, Piscinus is: Can we do that? That's the big question. And if so, how do we do that? And so I really appreciate that you asked about principles because we're working with a number of principles. And if on on the Piscinus Ranch website, you can find um, you can find those. But a lot of those are also the same principles that folks working in the realm of soil health are using, which is um, basically to keep the soil covered throughout the year, to keep diversity high, keep living roots in the soil as much as possible. Um, have a context, in other words, have, have, have a vision, um, integrate livestock. And so there's the, the, the list kind of goes on and all of these things are, are, are pretty basic. Um, the one that we, we often don't get to is, 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 is integrating livestock. And here, here at Piscinus, my goal is actually to get beyond livestock as a tool to restore ecosystems, but I don't want livestock to be the focus. Um, it's 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 great because it also allows another revenue stream. But really, right. what I want to do is is not see how many farm animals I can have on this place, but to see how much biodiversity that is is native to this spot. How much of that we can get to return. And so that is, um, and so that includes birds, insects, all kinds of animals, um, and microbiology. So um, that is the that that's the big picture thing: is how do we actually increase the the productivity and the resiliency and just the 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 health, the inherent health of, of a piece of land through our practices. You're you're steeped in. I I know you mentioned sort of a uh, biological, uh, agricultural education at the at at one point, and I'm just you know this uh, this inclusion of diversity sounds also sort of like a permaculture principle. It's sort of echoing some of these things. Do you, are, you know, are you pulling from all these different ways as you build this stuff, or is or are these things that sort of transcend? all agriculture and then really have been handed down from nature originally. Uh, yeah, I think ultimately that we're, this, we're, we're just trying to, to figure out how to, how to work with nature, what the principles of nature are and how we can first stay out of the way. And um, then second, maybe even 
participate in a way that that allows the the nature to express itself again in 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 these areas, which is basically the majority of the world now that we've we've damaged. Yeah. And so there's and and you know I am by no means the first person to think about this, and and um, there's um, there's a lot of people who have been talking about this for a, a while now, basically since since um, kind of since contemporary agriculture began. Um, there's been people saying, "Wait a minute, this some of this stuff doesn't seem right." And so I will. Um, I've, I've I've definitely been influenced by by people like Alan Savory. I have not really delved that much into permaculture, um, but uh, I've really a lot of writers like Aldo Leopold, um, uh, Masanova Fukuinka, um, people mm. like that. I've 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 been paying attention to, and um, and then interestingly enough, I've uh, I've gone out of the realm of viticulture. Um, it was it was in in ranching where I got a lot of my um, experiences and realizations that you can restore ecosystems through um, by mimicking the way nature functions. We've we've re- when yeah. we've removed that ability for nature to function as a whole, if we start if we start mimicking that process, even if we're not using the native animals there, then we can we can still restore things. And for me, the the ultimate idea is. Is not how do we take over the natural world with domestic animals? It's how do we return as much of that natural world to to the other species that have just as much a right and need to be here as we do. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I, I I wasn't going to ask this, but you've just brought it up a couple times about how you know humans were trying to to do no harm first. But you know, I I often think that we humans get a a bad rap, you know, um, and it's based on our recent uh, performance in relationship with nature. But I feel like prior to you know the last you know couple hundred years, we did we did a pretty good job. Like we we were pretty well integrated. And it sounds like I guess my question for you is: Do you is that something you're conscious of as you as you think about these things that humans really we really do have this? Uh, has it made you more conscious of our capacity to? actually be a force for good in in relationship with nature like that are are that we as part of nature you know that once we get in tune with it we we actually can do we can do immense good we can do things very quickly in a positive way um I don't know. yeah i and until probably this year i was still wondering if we actually can um in in in, vit- in viticulture situations I've i've seen this in in rangeland situations, but in okay. viticulture in particular, I, I still question it deeply. And the big moment this year for me and and my my crew, we have we run an internship program here, and um, happened when this summer I I, I I ask people, I remind them to pay attention to sounds, to especially bird sounds, but also insects and. And because that's such an important part of our sensory, our, our sensory perception of of the natural world, and and so they were they were paying attention to the bird sounds. And one day I got a text and it said, "There's a really interesting sounding bird here." And I just responded back and said, "Does it sound like a cat?" And they said, "Yeah." And I said, "I'll be right up." <laughs> so that bird is a tricolored blackbird, which is indigenous to California. It looks a lot like a red winged blackbird. It's a colonizing bird, so they live in big colonies. Uh, kind of the last, the, the other colonizing bird that we had in this country was the passenger pigeon. And mm-hmm. the tricolored blackbird is well on its way to becoming uh, a historical relic like the passenger pigeon. Its numbers have dropped dramatically in the state, uh, primarily due to, to agricultural practices. And so we would get a couple here and there, and, and you, you would hear this funny sound. And so each day we were seeing a couple more, a couple more. And finally, one day I called up our local bird guide who had told me at one point, she said, you know, we might be able to get a few more tricolored blackbirds here if we pay attention and, and manage well. And I called her up and I said, hey, we, we have what seems like, a, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred tricolored in a flock here. And she said, uh, you probably just don't know how to count birds. <laughs> and I said, well... <laughs> Maybe so, but come out here and check it for yourself. 
And she came out and she said, oh my God, you have like at least 800. And wow. this, this, is, this is crazy. And so <laughs> uh, the, it, about the same time, Fish and Game came to look at a pond we have down kind of below the vineyard. And they were looking for uh, red-legged frogs. And fortunately, one of the one of the one of the guys in that group had spent time in the Central Valley and knew about tricolored blackbirds. And he heard them, and he said, "We can't go in there. They could possibly be nesting here." And he said, "But what is back there where they're all flying?" And the, the guy that was with him said, "The vineyard." And he said, "You must have a lot of insects in the vineyard." And he said, "And he said, yeah, actually, we're monitoring that, and we do." And so, <laughs> anyway, um, it was an incredible display every day having this huge flock of tricolor blackbirds come in the morning they would spend around the outside of the vineyard and they would land on the ground and then the birds in the back would fly with the birds in the front and they kept this rolling thing going on i guess which would bring up insects and then in the mm. afternoon they'd be in the vineyard and they'd be doing less of that rolling thing and kind of this broader um hunting pattern and so i i, I can't even really express what a how good that felt to have a bird that was basically declining everywhere else that had decided that this vineyard was suitable. And according to the, to the, to the local bird guides, he told me the whole process about how the males come. They have to find a spot and they have to prove to the female that it is a good spot for food and to nest. <laughs> and, and by the way, I think it's like a ratio of five or six males to every female. And so wow. they, um, they deem this place worthy. And they they successfully nested just down below at the uh, at the at this little pond. So um, uh, that was um, to me just a really exciting indicator that we were on the right track. I mean, we're we're all so we're monitoring bird populations, insects, uh, soil, all of these things, and we're getting really positive results from all of that. And to me, that is what my that's kind of what my definition of regenerative agriculture is. It's not really what your certifying agent organization is and, and what you say you're doing or what the score of your wine is or whatever. It's what is actually occurring on the land. And so um, the the vineyard now is a is a eBird hotspot. And eBird is a online thing put together by Cornell University. And a lot of birders use that to, to track their own birds that they're watching, but to see where other birds are. And so that's Amazing. now a hot spot. And we have people that will come and stay at the ranch just to go birding out in the vineyard. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and so so we have, we actually have, it's kind of like a citizen science thing happening of, of monitoring our birds. And, um, and then we have a, a number of other things we have going on for monitoring plants, uh, insects, and soil biology. So those are all things we're tracking because we think we're doing the right thing, but we want to, and, and we're also doing comparisons to neighboring vineyards. We think we're doing the right thing, and we want to just have some verification that that is true. Yeah, since you are pioneering a lot of the the viability of this, I think it's really important to be able to show that data for others who will come behind and or, or want to actually, you know, may, might debate its efficacy. Um, to have that, and, and presumably all of those numbers are on the in, on the rise, from what you've said. Yeah, in terms the, of uh, the, 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 the count exciting, of the diversity. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, uh, no, I was just going to say the exciting one is the uh, well, one of the exciting ones is the soil carbon went up by probably a little over one percent before we even planted the vineyard, and that's because we implemented these basically ecological restoration practices of of managing livestock in a way that they mimic native herbivores and so we were able to get some pretty profound um healing and um building of soil happening even before we we planted so that's and then yeah uh, plant plant species numbers are going up every year um insect numbers seem very good that's that that was the one area where we actually had to we hired somebody to come in and do insect monitoring for us but um one of the things that we did learn from an entomologist, who, the guy who started Ecdysis, which is an organization researching regenerative agriculture all over the country now, and John Lundgren, the founder, is a PhD entomologist. And I said, what do we look for to, to just as farmers to know that we have a good insect population? He said, look for spiders. 
if you have a yeah. good spider population, you have a good insect population. And mm. so one of the things that we're having to do this year, and it took us a while to figure this out, but we're having to put insect caps on all of our drip emitters. And we're doing that because we found out that we we're getting spiders that were going inside those the beaks of the drip emitters. And they were living in those, but they were also laying their eggs in there. And that was clogging up those emitters. And so <laughs> I thought, well, if you're going to have a problem, having one that <laughs> is indicating that you're on the right track, we'll, we'll deal with that. We'll, we'll put 30,000 insect caps or whatever we have to yeah, do. Exactly. <laughs> it's a pain in the butt, but I guess it's a good problem to have. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's, I just want to go back to the birds and so much of what you said about that and how meaningful that is to you resonates with me. I recently was at a, a, a wine tasting. I mean, we, I was pouring our wine at, at uh, a wine tasting that was hosted by one of the, like a, an ecological landscaping company here in Los Angeles, um, Viola Gar Gardens. And they, after I sort of gave my presentation about the wines and what we do as an ecological winery, they have an in-house ecologist who got up and spoke. And really the first thing that he did was have us all just start listening. And it was like immediately these things that had be that were just the sort of white noise for our preoccupations suddenly came into focus. And, and, uh, and it was the, and then we began to hear these individual voices of the birds as he called them out and called them out by name and then could describe when you hear that, you know that this kind of vegetation is nearby because this is their habitat or this is their food source. And it was like this instant immersion into a three-dimensional perspective on the landscape that we had sort of just felt like we were disconnected from. All of a sudden, it was like we had this ability to see into the forest around us, into the landscape around us, even where we couldn't see just by paying attention to what we could hear that the birds were telling us. And it seems like this is one of those pieces of knowledge that I think really makes, you know, the natural world magical once you listen to it, once you hear it, once you understand it and how reconnecting to that. I mean, it's probably knowledge that we all once had hundreds of years ago as more being more connected to the natural world. And when you find when, you know, you have this experience where somebody can sort of explain it to or you or like you when somebody when you start to see these things, when you you're telling your people to actually pay attention to these things and and you start to notice these changes happening, it's it's an amazing thing. It's re it's magical. And I, I don't know if you've ever read the book Pastoral Song. Have you ever read that? I have not. I highly recommend it. It is, um, and, and anybody listening, I highly, highly recommend it. It's a beautifully written book by a, um, a farmer who is currently farming in the sort of highlands of England. And it is three generations, like, and it, it sort of starts with his grandfather who had like a multi- purpose farm you know like a, a traditional farm that was um balanced and diverse and polycultural and then it went through the green revolution and and everything that came with that and the first image that he gives in that and then it comes to the to the you know where we are now seeing the failing of that and we're actually going back to you know the like he's now starting to farm like his grandfather farmed um but with you know the science behind it like the sort of data that you are collecting as well to to inform the better choices and the way to you know to restore through natural systems but that the first image of the book is the uh the swallows that follow the plow as they sort of plow the field there and 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 then how he notices how they disappear like and he hear, listens to their song and watches them you know and and it becomes the symbol of the the health of that system um, because there's so there are things that the plow is turning up that the birds want to eat. There are birds that are living there because there's habitat for it, and then they sort of disappear during the Green Revolution. And now he's starting to see them again in his fields, and that it becomes this framing device. And it's, I just think this paying attention to the birds is something that you know I. I think it's a really great way to get reconnected <laughs> to what we're doing, you know, what the reason why we're doing what we're doing. It's funny. That's way, where you started as well with birds of prey and rafters. And, and um, are you, are you doing things like that where you're actively, you know, putting out owl boxes or bird boxes, things like that around the vineyard? Yes, we have about, um, I think we have about 60 bluebird swallow boxes 
and um, around the vineyard. And then we have, um, I don't know, maybe a dozen, 15 owl boxes in the area of the vineyard. We have, we have about 60 owl boxes around the ranch right now. So we, we are, right. we are the, the, this, this kind of uh, pr- the practices that we're doing in the vineyard, we're also doing on, on the ranch as a whole. So we're using holistic planned grazing throughout the ranch. And the ranch is 7,600 acres. So the vineyard is just a small portion. It's what, 25 acre vineyard or? It's, it's 25 okay. acres. Yeah. 25. Yeah. But um, historically, historically there, there used to be a thousand acres of vineyard on this ranch. Oh, wow. It used to be okay. part of Almaden, which was 6,000 acres. And I think between 1965 and 1995, it was uh, the largest vineyard in the country and one of the largest in the world. Wow. Okay. Um, do, is, are there plans to make it that big again, or is it not? Uh, not, not that big. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, that would be interesting. Uh, I'm, I, I want to get into some details, if that's all right. Ask sure. you some specifics, if, if that's cool. I know, I mean, so since I brought up the, the, the bird boxes, and you have some raptor boxes, um, I know that you've had to deal with squirrels. And I'm guessing that you are probably against using poison uh, because of the raptors and the way that that affects downstream ecosystem, you know, impacts. Um, what do you do besides the bird box for squirrels and, and yeah, how bad of a problem are squirrels? Yes. Yeah, so squirrels can be pretty severe. We actually, the, in 2017 was when we planted the vineyard and we lost a third of all the plantings that first year to squirrels. Um, and so that's, um, the, the, so that's you know when you're trying to increase biodiversity, <laughs> um, yeah, you, 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 you get everything. <laughs> and so um, the uh, the the obvious thing is how do how do we how do we increase our predators and and so like the owl boxes don't address that because the owls are nocturnal and the squirrels are diurnal. Right. So we do have we do have a pretty good population of of coyotes and bobcats. But the one that is probably the most important is snakes. And ah. um, interestingly enough, when we planted the vineyard, I had, a, I had a crew here that was planting, and I had to go do something for a while. And I told them if they saw any snakes not to kill them, that I would take care of them. And I was doing this all in Spanish. And they misunderstood that to mean that I would kill them. And so when I was uh-huh. gone for just an hour, they ended up killing 13 snakes. Oh, no. and, uh, most of those were rattlesnakes. And uh, so we, um, basically we've, we've had a, we don't kill snakes on, on the, uh, on the ranch in general. And, um, and we don't even kill rattlesnakes in the vineyard. Um, so in fact, is everybody we, wearing s- snake boots, Kevlar boots in the vineyard or is it not? No, much of a no it, 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 it's, it's not that bad, but you just, you just yeah. pay attention that, that they're around. Right. Yeah. And, um, so the and and this year was actually a, a, another uh, pretty high population of rodents in general, uh, um, squirrels and gophers, and it was a low population of of barn owls. Very few of the boxes uh, did we have nests in. We did have a few, and that seems to be something to do with the drought. We had we had the owls around, but mm. you know when they really consume the rodents is when they are feeding nestlings. Uh, so, um, got it. yeah, so that's, a, that's, um, so really we, we have not, we have not solved or come into balance with the squirrels in a way that I would like to, I'm the main predator right now. And, um, so that's mainly through shooting uh-huh. and yeah, we don't, we, we don't use poison for them because that, that would definitely have negative consequences. And we yeah. are in a lead free zone because we have the California condors here. And I, yeah. I wouldn't use lead anyway, being a big fan of raptors. Um, yeah. So, um, so at this point, um, it's uh, we. I think we still need to get more predators, and the one that I think would probably be the one of the greatest ones is the weasel, which is not protected oh. in California. And occasionally we f- see a few, but um, I would really like to get a nice colony of weasels established. Great idea. Yeah. Well, can you describe? Let's. Let, I I feel remiss that we haven't talked about how you've trellised the vineyard now. So you 
you are no longer doing the VSP with the electric wires along the grow region. You're, you've set up a whole system to rethink how you do this. And I wish you could describe that. for. Sure. And again, this was, this whole process was when I was hired here by Sally, I actually didn't know what kind of trellis system I was going to use. My thought had been to use a completely overhead trellis system, kind of like they use, it's called a DOV system, dried on the vine that they use for raisins in the Central Valley. Oh, okay. And that's a that's a complete overhead system. And uh, huh. I think, um, well, first let me preface by saying that there's probably, a, there are a number of trellis systems that would um, would work for grazing. And we had a, a couple of the women who are running the Porto Protocol in Portugal were visiting us this past summer. And uh-huh. when they saw our trellis system, they got kind of teary-eyed and reminiscent. And they said, you know, we used to have overhead systems all over Portugal, and now you hardly see them at all. And I said, mm-hmm. yeah, you, you, could, you could have grazed the whole country then. <laughs> right, right. But um, so what I ended up coming across was something called the Watson system. And this is a yeah. this is an elevated V trellis. It looks a lot like a, a raisin or table grape system. And it is our, our cordon wire is at about 66, 68 inches. So that's fairly high. And that's where the V starts. That's the bottom of the V. Um, and our spacing is 12 feet between rows and six feet between vines. This system was originally developed in Texas by um, a guy named, uh, his last name is Watson. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, forgetting, I'm, I'm forgetting his first name. But, <laughs> Mr. Um, Watson. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Watson is a retired petroleum engineer. And so he, he probably had an advantage of being an out-of-the-box thinker. And uh-huh. his vineyard is, is near Houston. And right. the, he didn't, he, he, as far as I know, um, nobody else is, is, is grazing under the Watson system, but um, okay. it's, pri- it's predominantly being used in Texas and Georgia. And I first learned about it from my friend Fritz Westover, who's a viticultural consultant and has an online uh, uh, kind of vineyard uh, viticulture academy. And um, he had, he was giving a presentation at a, at a workshop that we were both at, he wasn't there to present, but somebody had canceled out. And so they asked if he could do a quick presentation. And he did one on trellis systems and he showed that Watson trellis design. And I'd never heard of it before. So I called him up and said, asked if he thought it would work for grazing. And he said, well, as far as he knew, nobody was using it for that, but he thought it was very possible. Um, so I had him give me names of people that were using that in Texas that he, that he thought were good growers. And I went, I, my mom lives in San Antonio. So I picked her up and we went traveling around looking at that. And I decided that that's what I was going to use. Um, we, mm-hmm. and so that's what we installed for our trellis system. And it's because the spacing is four feet at, per, per row, the, or, or the uh, coverage of that V is four feet per row. That means that half of the space is under shade, especially during the hottest part, part of the day when the sun is directly overhead. So one of my one of my goals in creating a vineyard from the ground up to restore ecosystem health, increase biodiversity, is how do we how do we create something that is conducive to and kind of mimicking because this is this is basically kind of a shrubland um when at least at this phase of geological history and right so i selected a a, a slope facing north because in if i'm just looking out the window now and that's where all the trees are, are on the slopes facing north so that's where the perennials that's where the ecosystem is saying if you want a perennial um the north slope is the best place for this for this area to to um to establish great observation so so we we selected that site because of that and we have this plant growing that is a grapevine that isn't normally its native habitat is to grow up a tree which always surprises me when people say well can you get a grapevine to grow that high (laughs) i just remember (laughs) in arizona seeing a uh, vetus arizonica vine growing up it 
at the top of a mountain, there must have been an underground spring there because everything was giant and I could not see the top of that vine. It was at least a hundred feet tall. <laughs> right. Yes. And yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. vines can grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so the great thing about this is that it's 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 growing up. It's easy for picking. It's not so close to the ground that you're getting the heat effect. Not that we would necessarily have that because we keep our soils covered throughout the year, either with with dead mulch or living plants. And so our soil is much cooler than a, a soil that's exposed. And that is by by practice and design. And then right. our vines are up a little bit higher. The the wind we we track the wind and the wind generally blows from the same direction and we set up the rows so that the wind is going up the rows and so we're getting kind of a cooling effect from that yes. furthermore the fruit is has this shaded kind of dappled light and we can control that by our by our canopy management and and through our pruning so all, all of those things can contribute to the effect that we're trying to achieve in in the light and then the vines hang over this trellis system. So they, they're, they're going up the V and then they kind of arch down. And when they get into the range of the sheep, the sheep can do the shoot tipping. So they're right. doing the suckering for us. They're doing the shoot tipping. And as you, you know, you ask one question, what does this trellis look like? But it leads into how does it function too? <laughs> right, right, yeah. And so the sheep are doing the floor they're, they're doing the floor management. We don't have weeds because we just have a, a diversity of plants that are growing there, some of which the sheep really like to eat. Some of them are introduced, some of them are native. And uh, we're finding that it, we're, we're finding about, oh, probably about six to a dozen new species each year. Some stuff is kind of wacky. We, we have a bunch of palm trees that have popped up out there. And the exciting thing is, is that we're getting a lot of a lot of native stuff, especially during the summer. Things like milkweed that are really beneficial to the pollinators and, and oh, yeah. native insect plants. So anyway, you've got this trellis system that is providing shade that is coming up a little bit in, in elevation, which also makes it beneficial. We, we, we're dealing with climate change, not just global warming. We've had right. the last two years, we've had frosts in late April, which have, when I put wow. the vineyard in, the the longest standing employee on the vineyard was a, was a Hispanic guy who'd been here for 50 years. And I asked him if we would have frost up there. And he said, you will never have frost up there. And so we've had frost <laughs> two times now. So things wow. are changing. And the vines that were still small, that hadn't gotten up on the trellis up, up to the uh, up to the cordon wire, got hit by frost. None of the vines that were up on the trellis system had frost damage, or uh -huh. had any frost damage that was enough to affect the vine in, in, a, in a in a negative way for like fruit yield or, or leaf dieback or things like that. So uh -huh. we're getting we're getting multiple benefits from that. Um, the folks love to pick in that because they're not stooping down; they're actually picking at about eye level. And right. it works very well for having one person across from another. We're thinking that we could create a kind of a, a vineyard dating service during harvest because you're <laughs> across from another person. You don't have, you, have, you, you kind of have a somewhat of a screen so you don't have the uncomfortableness of just looking someone directly and right, you can right. talk freely. And when you get to you the like end that. of the row, if, it, if the person didn't, if you didn't jive, then you just switch people. <laughs> Yeah, you just got it's like speed dating, yeah. row by row. I I think that people could pay for harvest. For yeah, that's season, that's that's, you know? that's, that's yeah, people will pay for harvest, <laughs> and then they can come back here for their wedding because we have a wedding venue. <laughs> <laughs> and so that grow wire is around sixty six to sixty eight inches, I believe. Is that right? Just so that's correct. A, okay. And then the drip and wire then, and then, is it, the drip wire is just below that, about a foot below that. So that is also high, which so enables sheep and and animals to go freely in any direction under the vineyard as well as humans right you can just duck under easily and right you're so short enough, in, you, in, you don't even have to being, duck yeah so instead of being <laughs> being stuck in this particular row which sheep don't really dig that too much having to yeah and, and they will try and break through and often mess up irrigation systems and stuff doing that yeah so having it open like that 
all of a sudden, even though by visually looking at it, it's linear in the way it's set up, it's not linear in the way that it functions and that you can you can go in any direction. It's more like a forest. Right. A, like a vine forest. Mm-hmm. Where, um, which I just love. So is there a decrease in yield per acre because of this 12-foot spacing between the rows? And I, and I know it sounds like it's necessary because you have a four-foot, just with the wires going out with the, the top V above the grow wire that you have two feet out from that grow wire. And then I'm imagining probably another foot with just draping vines sort of sprawling out beyond that. Um, so you're already losing, you know, six feet of that, that row. So you have basically like a six foot row when you have 12 foot spacing. <laughs> um, but, do, but are you losing yield? Um, so this per, year, per acre, our, I guess, yield. Yeah. Right. This year was our second crop. So I, I am not going to be able to accurately answer that question for us here. But yeah. I talked to Fritz about that. We we did a joint workshop here talking about this, the, the, the Watson system and, and organic vineyard management. And that question was asked and by me first and then some other folks. And he's actually written an article or co-authored an article on the Watson system. And what they're finding is that it actually outperforms a VSP system by the acre, and but it doesn't quite outperform a something like a Geneva double curtain or something like that, which is for really high vigor sites. So what's happening yeah. is, is even though we are, well, so we're at about 605 vines per acre and a, a, a vineyard maybe in Napa is going to be closer to 1500 vines per acre. So, mm-hmm. but what's happening is we, because it's divided, it's divided both ways. It's like a, it is like a VSP, but then you're putting some of the shoots one direction and some the other. And because right. you're doing that, you can actually have more spurs on that cordon than you would in a regular VSP system and still maintain better um, better light exposure and, and air exposure. So, Right. I was going to ask about that. Okay. So you can, yeah, it's almost like you can double up on that. Right. So it's, uh, so we are, we're, we're expecting that we, that we'll probably be able to get around three to possibly Fritz said as high as five tons to an acre. Okay. Yeah. That's, that sounds like a happy amount. Yeah. <laughs> sounds I, I, like, I think, a, like an economical amount. Right. I think, I mean, I think like an economically feasible amount. Right. Right. That, that, that would work for us. Okay. Um, and you're doing some pretty incredible stuff in terms of just, you, I mean, you're, you're, you're farming organically or, or better than obviously. Um, but in terms of your, you're not introducing, petrochemical, synthetic chemical sprays and pesticides and fungicides. Can you talk about what you are using? And I mean, I, I heard you talking about using bricks, increasing your bricks level to just avoid ever having to worry about like a glassy wing sharpshooter kind of situation. Can you talk to, to that a little bit? Sure. Um, the, another big inspiration for me and in, in my work has been John Kempf for founded Advancing Ecological Agriculture. And uh, he, in, in listening to s- some of his work, he was talking about the fact that if you get your bricks up, and I think this was in a podcast interview he did of somebody else, that if you get your bricks up to about 14, about 14 or this 15. Is, this is sap. Uh, like this is the the bricks of the the, the stems, the the leaves, that kind of, that, exactly. those bricks, not, not yeah. fruit bricks. Exactly. So we're, so we're looking at, we're, we're taking the, the leaves and petioles of a grapevine and we're, we're, we, sometimes it takes a pretty heavy duty um, press to get some sap out of that. And then we're testing what the bricks is of that. And we, we have found that without grazing, just based on our, our, our fertility practices that we do here, um, we've been able to get a bricks as high as 17 or 18. Um, okay. But when we integrate the animals, we've been able to get our bricks as high as 22. And it's funny because mm-hmm. last year when we harvested the Grenache, we actually harvested it at 21. So we had a higher bricks. <laughs> I was going to say you can make, grapes. <laughs> <laughs> you can make wine from your vines if it, yeah. the grapes don't work out. <laughs> right, just crush everything. <laughs> <laughs> 
but uh, so anybody uh, buying your grape should be doing whole cluster. It sounds like <laughs> keep those stems in. Um, wow, that's a, and does that have you found that that's true? That having this high sap, I mean, high bricks level in in the plant prevents things like glassy wing sharpshooters. So we've we've not had any problem with insects. Um, wow, at, at all, and and the and, and that's been kind of nice. And huh. so, and we were b- before getting b- before hearing about using the bricks as a, as a means or monitoring your bricks level as a means of knowing if you might have potential insect problems. Um, we were monitoring bricks in our forage on the ranch because a high bricks also is indicative of high quality forage that is able that is going to be able to put weight on on livestock faster. Right. Right. And and just general quality of the feed. So we we have we actually had a bunch of refractometers on the on the ranch for livestock <laughs> crew and for some of the workshops that we do here. So the, started and it was just last year that we really started paying attention to the bricks and the vines, and and we just we yeah we've not had any any insect problems. Uh, I did pull off a uh, a hornworm in a grow tube a couple days ago. But that was that was on a on a young vine, and I suspect it it, it had not it didn't didn't have the benefit of being grazed and a couple other things or browsed. So um, so those those types of insects are out there, but the 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 principle behind that is that an insect has a primitive digestive system, and their whole their whole means of 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 being in this world of their sensory perception is geared towards finding plants that are that are basically have low bricks because they can digest those those insects that are going to eat plants they need stuff that's basically kind of on its way down and so they have they have this their, their visual ability can hone in on those and so that's um that's uh, that's one of the, and so that's one of the ways that we keep the bricks up is, is by is by browsing the vines and I think that's coming from a couple of things the saliva has been shown to have beneficial properties to allowing a plant to restore um, it also may induce a plant a, a plant response to as as like a warning response to cause that plant to produce certain chemicals that would deter something browsing it again right and then we also have the 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 nutrient cycling that's occurring from the dung and the urine which may impart benefits to the grazing animal but or to the plant but we still have we still have a lot to learn in that realm we do know that that it appears to be that one component of the saliva is vitamin b1 which i think is thiamine and that has okay. been found in the saliva of grazing animals, and that might have a little bit of a of a, a boost to the to the uh, immune system of the plant. Is the Watson system any more expensive than uh, you know any other trellising system? And 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 how much would you estimate per acre? I mean, do you have those kind of numbers for somebody who's considering you know, you know starting a vineyard? Yeah, so I, I think this is going to vary depending on where you are. And my latest numbers, so we, we divided the vineyard up into two phases. Um, the f- each is about 12 and a half acres. And the reason for that is just because we figured we would be coming across things that that we hadn't considered that would come up that we wanted, that we might change in the second phase, which was definitely true, and in particular for the trellis system. So the trellis, the cost of the trellis per acre in 2020 just for trellis materials was about $5,200. And I checked, I recently checked what it costs to put a trellis up, a VSP trellis in Napa, and that cost was closer to 9,000. So this would actually Mm -hmm. be less expensive, but it it only makes sense because you have half the rows Right. And, yeah. Um, well, close to half the rows, and a lot less vines per row. And right. basically, a trellis is just a bunch of posts and wire. And right. so, if you're reducing, if you're increasing your yield per trellis post, which is what you're doing with the Watson system, then it it, it kind of makes more economic sense. Huh. 
That's that's fascinating. Now you're growing vinifera. I I'm pretty sure. Do you yes. think that? I mean, what I know, what little I know about hybrids, um, they or or American native varieties is they're they tend to be grown on a high wire as well, but it's a single cordon, and it's because unlike vinifera, they don't tend to have vertical growth. They tend to have drapey. Uh, downward growth um and so it you know you start them high and they sort of drape down it seems like hybrids would be a sort of a sh just a natural integration for this kind of trellis system and integration where, where you're doing any kind of grazing based viticulture because you know they're already trained high traditionally do you have any thoughts about that i i i do and i <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> I think that it would probably work well. You might want to modify it slightly. You might not okay. need the the V might be fine as a as a as a with less of a width and having okay. to catch wires a little bit closer together. I've talked to one of my apprentices here. Actually, before she came here, she was in Vermont, and I think she was working with uh, a family who you have done a podcast interview of, um, and. She showed me some pictures from there, and I looked at it and said, well, um, I see that these are drooping down fairly well, so that would be a problem for grazing because they'd be eating those vines. But I think if you had, if you just maybe brought in your V a little bit and brought your wires closer together, that it would work really well for that. Huh. So, yeah, because they're not using any V at all, right? That they, the one that right. you saw, I mean, right. right? So it's just that top wire cordon, and they let it hang down naturally right. um so yeah so you're saying give it a little a little lift but it doesn't need as much as the watson like the full two feet on either side of the grow wire that, that's my suspicion interesting all right um man this is just such such incredible stuff <laughs> um thank you so much for all this i i'm I know I, for anybody that's been listening and is having trouble visualizing this, I highly recommend everybody check out um, if you could give the website where people can see these photos uh, for the ranch. I mean, it's all, uh, there's some great shots just to wrap your head around what we've been talking about. Yeah, that's the, the website is, is www.pisinusranch.com. And if you go to the vineyard, there is a number of photos and then there's also some links to some other presentations that I've done. And one of those is a webinar that I did for green cover. And so I'm showing some photos on that as well. And then there is a in vineyard interview that was done with uh, Liz Carlisle, who is a, who writes a lot on regenerative ag and is a professor at UC Santa Barbara. Got it. So P A I C I N E S ranch.com. Um, amazing resource i that the the green cover uh youtube video where your talk with green cover is really amazing some of the photos the side by side comparisons are just striking and yeah it, it it's very practical a, it's a ton of great you know sort of powerpoint style information that people can get from there as well and i just want to put a plug out there if anybody is looking for great you know local california meat um, you guys have a pretty awesome pastured meat shop on the Piscinus Ranch website as well, um, which I wish I discovered sooner because I would have been shopping there sooner. I, I don't know. And now, you know, that anybody who's listened to this kind of has gotten to know their farmer pretty well and knows how this uh, these the 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 holistic system that they're they're being raised in. This is uh, really exciting stuff. I mean, something to support. And we all want that kind of food in our life anyway. Um, so just throwing that out there. Is there anything else that you you want to promote or or talk about? Um, just that our overall philosophy at the ranch is to be open source, um, and so we are we are certified organic. But um, and I I think that that one of the things that's important to us is that it, this not just happen here, and that we inspire others because this is not the only way to do things. And there's a, one of the strengths of humans is that we, we do have this capacity for creativity. And our hope is that others will, will learn from what we're doing and take their creativity and expand on it because we're just scratching the surface here. And there's so much more that is 
possible and and also beyond just grape growing just <laughs> had a guy yeah. uh, visiting here from israel he, he, he heard uh i think it, it, it was either the green cover or the or the regenerative ag podcast and he he came here because he's he, he was he was visiting the country he was actually a cotton breeder and he just we just brainstorm on ideas of taking this to other crops and and the potential and again the overarching thing is is how do we restore our ecosystems because we've got a lot of farmland out there and if we can if we can increase biodiversity on our farmland well actually it's not an if thing. We have to increase biodiversity on our agricultural lands or we're just going to be swirling down the toilet here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I mean, you, you offer internships. Is that right? There's a big educational component to what you guys are doing. We, we, we do. And that um, we're probably going to change that around a little bit and make it an apprenticeship program. Apprenticeship, um, okay and try and go a little more in depth and um, attract people that are definitely going into um, ideally regenerative viticulture in some form, um, or it could be something closely related, but um, ideally attracting people so that we can train people to go out there and work with other folks and, and get the, uh, increase the rate of, of uptake. Right. Yeah. That's that's really incredible. Well, Kelly, thank you so, so much. This is, I mean, really, really amazing stuff. I think it is where we have to head. And, you know, I think it, it's absolutely the future if we want to have a future. Um, I mean, the sooner we can make it our present, <laughs> the more likely we will be to have a future. And I just, again, want to reiterate, like, how, you know, I, how much I think it's just... Uh, this this idea of where you came from from the very beginning of of caring about these creatures and the natural world around you is uh something we can all just learn from i mean if 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 you take nothing else away from everything else that you said that's been immensely informative that is the only that's my you know that's what i would love anybody to to hear from you so thank you so much for for being that person and doing this work and thank you for what you're doing and getting, getting information like this out there. The sponsor for this episode is Centralis Wine. Centralis is an ecological winery that I started to protect or benefit the environment and my community with every business and winemaking decision. I envision a wine world in which humans are the students and servants of the non-human world, regenerating and protecting the vitality of ecosystems and promoting the diversity of life through wines that uniquely and deliciously reflect local abundance. Centralis wines feature foraged prickly pears, urban perennial polyculture wine garden produced grapes and other fruit, gleanings from urban fruit trees, dry farm century old vines, and organic and biodynamic viticulture. If this sounds interesting to you, join our email list or wine club at centraliswine.com. That's C E N T R A L A S wine.com.